You've probably learned about me by now that I don't shy away from difficult or uncomfortable scriptures. Sometimes the scripture is, is easier than others. Sometimes we more likely to feel joy after a scripture than we are some other scriptures. One of my teachers, Phyllis Tribble, wrote a book called Texts of Terror. And it's about the violence that is done to some of the women in the Bible, apparently with God's blessing, these texts of terror. Well, this is not a text of terror, but it does raise an eyebrow, doesn't it? Does it raise an eyebrow for you all? Look at this, uh, this Renaissance painting on the, on, the, on the front of your order of service. So there's a woman on her knees begging, and what does Jesus do? Look at his hand. This is Jesus' hand. Get away from me. Go on. Oh. And she says, well, doesn't even the dogs get crumbs? And he blows her off and is even obnoxious. Is that fair to say? Well, that's not the Jesus I know, we may say. But it's there. It's a story that was remembered enough that 50 years later, people told the story and it was written down as part of the Holy Scripture. So we can't shy away from this image of Jesus. This, this, we like the Jesus holding the children and saying, oh, I'll let all the children come to me. But this Jesus who says, get away from me, dog, we don't... I, I, I doubt there are many, many preachers who focus on that. Well, one thing you know about me is that I often give you an alternative interpretation. A, a, another way of looking at the Scripture. And so uh, a common way of, of preaching this would be to praise the woman because of her steadfastness. She just keeps owning. She just won't let him go. Like Jacob who held on to God and said, I will not let you go until you give me a blessing. This woman wouldn't let Jesus walk on until he healed her son. Mothers, you probably know what that feels like. You won't give up on, on your children's health, so she would not give up. And so she nagged and nagged. But she tried to debate with him too, right? She tried to argue this, why she would be entitled to healing also. And so the woman is held up in the New Revised Standard Version she is called a Canaanite woman. The Canaanite woman is held up as being an example of faith. She has so much faith that she will not let go until she is healed by her Lord. And so that's the happy ending of the day. And so everybody goes home feeling good. Yeah, we just got to keep, keep on it. We have to keep our faith up. We have to keep nagging. Keep praying and not give up. And that's, that's a good message. And it makes folks feel good, but for the people who told this story and for the, for the people who wrote down this story, I don't think that's what it was about. Because the people specified, what did they specify in this story? How does the story begin? The first verse is... He went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Now, when a, a biblical redactor, someone who takes the stories and edits them and then writes them down, the oral stories, when a redactor is, puts an event in a particular place, it's not by accident. And so if the message had just been simply that, oh, you should hang on to faith and keep nagging at God until you get your blessing, if you should just have faith even 
when God seems to ignore you, you should keep your faith going and, and just like the Canaanite woman. Well, if that had been the message, then that could have been done in anywhere, right? That could have been in, in, uh, in, in Judah, in Israel. But it wasn't. The author says, Jesus went to Tyre and Sidon. So that must be the key to understanding. Yes? Does that make sense? What was it about that place that gives this a different message? The lectionary gave us a clue. The lectionary sometimes puts, very often, the people who follow Jesus and the people who redacted the stories and, and wrote them down, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and others. There were 12 total, uh, 12 Gospels. Um, those people looked to Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, so they always wanted to connect back to Isaiah. And there was something going on here in this story of Jesus in Sidon, which has to do with Isaiah, and saying the lectionary brought that to us and reminded us, oh, that's the connection. And what did Isaiah say? Um, something like, the people from all nations, the foreigners I will bring back to my house. Does that sound familiar? Hmm, I wonder if that can give us a clue about what this is about. So my suggestion to you is that the key to understanding this story lies in the geography, what we would call the social geography of the region. And so let's look now. May I suggest that you look at your maps? I want to give you a quick history lesson. I know this, not everybody likes this kind of sermon, but I want to teach you something about this is so important because anytime you hear the word Samaritan or Samaria, you can't understand that without knowing what was Samaria and what's, what was the relationship between Samaria and Judah. So let's look at this map. We will, we'll refer to this now and then in sermons. You can see Judah in peach. Judah is what was what we now call Israel. Judah is where Jerusalem is. You see, above Judah is something called Samaria, a whole different region. Above Samaria is Galilee, and north of Galilee is uh, the Syrophoenician city-states, the Syrophoenicia. You see that? So what you need to understand is that at one time, Judah, at one time, uh, uh, there was a united kingdom, right, for about 200 years, from 1250 BCE to 1050. There was a revolution when Jer Jeroboam, Jeroboam's brother, Rehoboam, took the throne in Israel. Jeroboam didn't like it. He wanted to be the one to secede to the throne. And so there was a revolution, and the two kingdoms split in half. And the southern two kingdoms, Judah and Benjamin, stayed with Rehoboam. And the northern ten kingdoms, uh, ten tribes, went with Jeroboam. So that's why we have now Judah. There's no Israel on this map in the time of Jesus. It's Judah and Samaria. Now, this is, this is important, so if you're, if you're getting sleepy, wake up here, because this part's important. At about the year 1050, a northern kingdom invaded what was then called Israel and took it over. And it didn't kill the people or take them away like in Babylon. It, it let them stay there. And so the people started to just live their lives under, with a different government. And, they, and people, some people emigrated from Assyria, the Assyrian Empire, and they started to intermingle, intermarry. Think about this. Think about this for a people whose sense of identity was very closely tied to we are a chosen people. We are separate from others. We're different. We worship a different God. And in fact, we want to make sure we maintain our separateness, our distinctness. And so that's why we circumcise in order to mark our men to make sure everybody knows this is a Hebrew. 
This is a people for whom their sense of loyalty to these traditions was so important. And so when the northern kingdom, Israel, was invaded and the people started losing their specific identity, their sense of who they were as Hebrews, when they started intermarrying, not circumcising their sons, not going every year to Jerusalem to worship in the temple, they were losing their Jewishness, their Hebrewness. And the people in Judah who were maintaining those traditions looked down then on those people from the north who were losing their traditions. And they sort of dissolved into, they lost their identity of being Israelis and they dissolved into Assyria. And that's where we get the phrase, the ten lost tribes of Israel. Because Israel was lost, lost their identity. And so the Hebrews down in Judah looked to the people in the north, Samaria, as sort of halfway or, or unfaithful Jews. Half-breeds, they might have said. They did say. And so we need to understand, when you hear the word in the Bible, Samaria, Samaritan woman, the good Samaritan, it's not by accident. And it's not about what people think it's about. It has something to do with that division. And it's geographic, and it's religious, and it's ethnic. So, what was so shocking? Why did Jesus initially dismiss the Syro-Phoenician woman from way up here? She was a different ethnicity. She was not one of the chosen people. She was a hated ethnicity. Even if she was Hebrew by blood, she was hated because she lived on the other side of the border. And Jesus said, I didn't come for you people. I'm here for the sheep of Israel. Can you see, can you see what's the tension here? Anybody hearing this in Jesus' time or in the first hundred years would know immediately what this was about. This was the tension between here is Jesus, and by the way, where is Jesus from? Galilee, way up north. Jesus is also a foreigner, a half-breed in the eyes of the pure Hebrews down here in Judah. And a woman from just across the border, Syrophoenicia, just across the border from Galilee. And Jesus says, get away from me. I'm not for you. And now you know why Jesus was like that. Why did Jesus dismiss her so rudely? Ethnicity and geography are such a part of the story of Jesus. We can't understand the gospel without understanding these things. And so what did it mean for the people who heard this story? It wasn't just about having faith. It was about crossing a national border and going to the despised people. So that's something new to think about, right? Are you glad to know that? Or are you, are you interested in this kind of stuff? You just can't understand the gospel if you don't think about these things. So now we know why there was this tension, why a Seraphonician woman would be dismissed like a dog. But what does this cause you to think about Jesus? Jesus would never do that, right? He did, or it would not have been remembered and written down like that. There were so many stories about Jesus, only the ones that were really strong in people's memories that they told over and over for decades and decades, only those were the ones who got, that got written down. So if, it, if this were a little story from an edge of the empire, it wouldn't have made it into the gospel that we read today. So it did happen. And what does this tell us about Jesus? Does it shake your faith?
To me, this has to do with the humanity of Jesus. The fact that God comes to us in a particular time and place. God enters into human experience in a time and place and in a people. In this case, in the case of Jesus, Christ came into the world in the form of a human male from Nazareth, whose ancestry was Hebrew, and who dressed and ate and spoke according to the norms of that time. And so we see that Jesus was a Jew from the outskirts. And that's how he responded to things. Do we also believe that Jesus was divine? Yes. Now, how we understand the relationship between Jesus' humanity and divinity, this is something we're going to come back to in a future sermon, so you've got to stay tuned. Stay tuned for the continuing adventures. Next week, so we're not going to take this up today because it's a big, big thing. But when we read about Jesus, something doing which, Jesus doing something which is kind of not quite what we, ha- what we were told in, in Sunday school, We can stop and think about what any Hebrew teacher would have done at that time. But there's a difference here. What did Jesus do differently than the Pharisees or the Sadducees? How does the story end? What's the last verse of that scripture? Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. So the focus of the scripture, the, the focus of, of preaching on this is always the woman. Well, what happened to Jesus? Something happened to Jesus as a result of this exchange. This foreigner, this half-breed, despised woman. Taught Jesus something about who is God and what is faith. Jesus learned. Jesus learned to rethink things. If he had been viewing the world in that moment from the perspective of a pure Hebrew who looked down upon people from, from the Syrophoenician world, something clicked, and this despised woman on her knees begging for her son taught Jesus. And to me, that's a big deal. Jesus learned. Jesus learned something. And who taught him? That is the message of this scripture. That is a new powerful source of questions, a whole new set of questions that we can take to the Bible. And Try to understand better who was Jesus and who are we and what does it mean to learn and change and how are we supposed to deal with these despised people from the other side of the border. Let's pray together. Holy One, we prayed today in song. We pray that you would open our eyes so that we can see you. It is hard for us, trapped in our reality, trapped in these bodies, in this world, in this time and place, it is so hard to grasp the hugeness, to grasp a God that doesn't think like we do. It's so hard to understand. How could we truly treat everyone as your precious children? Dear Lord, we look to Jesus as our guide, as our example. We look to the life of Jesus the Christ as the life that teaches us how to live. And what we see today is that Jesus was open 
to hear a challenge to his thinking. He was open to be taught. Jesus was open to find out that he had been wrong all along. It is terrifying for us, dear Lord, to think about the possibility that we have been wrong for much of our lives. But if we want to follow Jesus, then we will do as Jesus did, which is to open our eyes, listen even to the most despised people, and learn that there is another way, that there is another way of thinking, that another way of living. If we open our eyes, we learn that there is a whole new universe out there that we could not see when we were stuck in our own clouded, dark sunglasses. And so we thank you, O oh Lord. Open us to see the truth, to learn the truth, and to change. Thank you, dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.